Very good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Murray Patterson. I am the chairman of the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society Scottish branch. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening, uh, and I hope that you enjoy your time with us. Uh, this evening, our speaker really needs no introduction. Paul Semple has been a Waverley fan all his life, and uh, about two years ago, he took on the job of uh, being general manager of Waverley Excursions Limited. And uh, at, the, at that time, no one could have anticipated the world it would now be in and the challenges that would lie ahead. Uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And that's certainly been the case with Paul. And it's my great pleasure now to ask him to present to you the talk, uh, Waverley Achieving 2020 and Beyond. So I have now much pleasure in inviting Paul uh, to come and speak to us now and uh, tell us of this uh, great challenge uh, and life in the hot seat and uh, the, the, this uh, time of great uh, challenge, I say, for Waverley, its people, and indeed, I suppose, for all of us. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Murray. Just share my screen so we can start. So hopefully everyone is now seeing the opening slide and allowing to begin. Um, as Murray has said, uh, yes, two years ago, I took on the position of general manager for Waverley and I uh, would not have foreseen exactly what was coming. And in my mind, I tend to think there were three, there's been three exceptional challenges, the boiler refit, COVID-19, and then more recently, the Brodick accident just at the end of the sailing season. Now, it's my intention to go through the presentation and give a picture diary of the boiler refit, then outline some of the challenges in reaching the season, the current winter refit work, the COVID-19 relief appeal, giving an update, and then look into 2021 and beyond. So I'll pick up the story on the 14th of January, 2020, when Waverley was moved by Tug to Greenock. Um, a memorable day because this had been a day which had been anticipated for quite some time. We had been working towards it thanks to the success of the Boiler Refit Appeal and it's worth just thanking everyone that supported Waverley in 2019 with the Boiler Refit Appeal because when we realised how much funding would be required to achieve the outcome of putting Waverley back into service, 2.3 million when you're starting at nothing seems a very high mountain to climb and it's remarkable that within six months of officially launching the appeal that we had achieved the 2.3 million target so thank you to everyone individuals businesses groups Scottish government in particular with the 1 million and the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society. So a photograph is Waverley headed down river for what would be seven months before she would return to the city. and entering the James Watt Dock under the cover of darkness. And the, the James Watt Dock at that time was busy. There were several ships in. It was really the busy time for Dales Marine Services, the shipyard, where the work would be undertaken. And a photograph of Waverley, just a couple of days after she arrived. Um, I can tell that just because some of the vents have already been removed around the side of the funnels. But just for a moment, it's worth just going back in time back to 1974, in the very same dock, Waverley was gifted for a pound. And that uh, position on the key wall there, she's almost at the same birth as she was in 1974, when she was handed over to the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society. By the 22nd of January, the first or major signs of this uh, refit was uh, in evidence as the funnels came off. Now the aft funnel wasn't completely removed and you can just see there the fueling station um, still in position and that was left in position. There was no need to disrupt the fuel tanks, the fuel lines um, going into the boiler room. But it also was very handy because it gave a point of reference for returning the aft funnel to exactly the right position. 
And throughout the work, I had several conversations with Dale's um, staff that the funnels had to be exactly perfect when they went back. You couldn't have two funnels that were out of rake or misaligned in any way. The forward funnel, it seemed to resist coming off. It was as if she was holding on to it. And you can see there's a photograph with some of the Dale's uh, staff. They are just trying to make the final cut. And uh, finally, when they did, there was this almost popping sound that the funnel was being released. And the funnel after been taken off. And you can just see there the uptake from the exhaust from the old boilers on the deck. This is a picture which you wouldn't really have shared too much earlier on um, when you were trying to sell tickets and look to Waverley Sailing. But now that we've completed the work, it seems OK to go back and share some of the kind of real inside pictures that just show the extent of the work. And this was the occasion when both boilers were removed. You can see there the, the workman standing on top of the port boiler, which was going to come out first. Now, to get the port boiler out, it's not just straightforward in terms of just lift it up and out it comes. It has to sort of navigate the, this, the gap, which is just to the left-hand side, which is where the bulkhead in the alleyway has been removed to allow the boiler to come out. And then the starboard boiler removed after. So that's the port boiler coming out. Um, as it did, the insulation just gave up. Um, and if you just look to the front of the boiler, you'll see there, there is some steel just cut. And that is where we had attempted to repair the boiler before deciding that actually the repairs required were far too extensive. And it just did not make sense to repair boilers that were heading for 20 years old with no real guarantee of how much longer they would survive. Um, if you, you know, if you're going to do the job, it would be do it right for the future to give Waverley a future. And then the starboard boiler coming out. The boilers were both removed straight away off to scrap. And there was what remained once the boilers were lifted out. Um, just up to the top of the picture, you'll see there in blue, that's uh, one of the old Scania uh, diesel alternators. And we took the decision that, that if you're lifting the roof off and you're taking out the boilers, then you may as well do the alternator and the electrical generating plants as well. Um, because as you can see, they're getting access to that is not particularly easy. So it made more sense just to do it all. And this is the thing we, we did as well as the boilers, the electrical systems, the power generating system on Waverley has been completely replaced. But we went one stage better. And rather than just replace two alternators, we ended up putting a third one in. And that third one is run in the evenings when there's less demand, but it also gives an additional backup. So again, it's sort of future-proofing Waverley. It's thinking to the future. This was more than just replacing the boilers. The view from the bridge, looking aft into the, the boiler room after the boilers were moved. And that's the same day that the boilers were taken out. By the evening, um, a lot of the bilges there that you see, the lower hull, um, had started to be cleaned up. Um, and really the workforce were very quick in moving. There was a lot of workforce there. Um, Dale's full credit to them in terms of being able to get going on this project as soon as the ship arrived. Moving on into February, and by this time the electrical work had started. You can see there the main switchboard, which is on the engine room platform, and that had been stripped out. But the, the actual unit that it sits in um, was remaining, so it still looked in, in tune with a ship from 1947. But behind that, of course, there's a lot more modern technology. Now, Waverley, through a few surprises, um, part of the annual survey work last year was um, checking the hull um, in the rear of the ship. And that involved removing the panelling in the dining saloon. Now, when we removed the panelling, it was very evident straight away that it wasn't going to go back up. This um, wasn't fit for further use, and we'd have to start replacing some of the bulkhead panelling. But there was, unfortunately, sections of steel underneath the windows that were going to require replacing. And each part of the ship's hull is checked every five years. 
And at that point, you've got to make a decision. If there's any parts of the steel that are worn or thinning, then yeah, are they good for another five years um, and therefore need replacing? And there was several parts in the dining saloon area that needed replacing. And I can remember the discussion where we started at the forward end of the dining saloon and started coming back. And I remember thinking, where do you stop? And we did have to keep going all the way through the dining saloon, the servery area, and then into the galley. So by the end of February, this project had grown quite a bit. Um, and that had started to change the sequence in which the project was going to unfold. You can just see there, just in, uh, towards the slight right of the picture, that part of the deck has been removed. There was some steel just in the very corner, the margin plate in the corner that was needing replaced, and uh, that was replaced. And again, Dale's moved very quickly on this work. Once the scope of the work um, was known, then they would present us with a price, and then we agree. And this was a process that was very quick. The only problem was it was remarkably frequent and therefore there was quite a lot of additional expense. But within the 2.3 million, there was a contingency. And early on, we felt quite comfortable about having that contingency. But as the project lengthened in terms of the time the ship was in the yard, then it became more of a concern that we were actually starting to use up that contingency. And that is the dining, sorry, the galley. Um, just showing the extent at which it started to feel that we really were taking the ship apart. I'll show another picture later to show it went back together. But it just gives you an idea of the work that was done beyond the boiler room and beyond the original plans. And the servery area in the dining saloon. And again, you can see there on the faraway bulkhead, the steel, the bare steel is showing because the, the bulkhead panelling had been removed. And again, it was removed and not fit for further use and therefore had to be replaced. By the 11th of March, she was in dry dock, moved into dry dock at the beginning of March. Now this was a change to the sequence of the project because we had found some steel in the lower part of the boiler room, which needed to be replaced. Now, we took the decision that when you put the new boilers in and you're expecting at least 20 years, the steel underneath them needs to be good for that period of time because it would be very difficult to try and replace some of that steel with the boilers in situ. And there were several areas in the boiler room where the steel had proven a little bit thin in terms of looking to head to the future, and uh, we had to replace it. And there's a section of the ship's hull being replaced uh, just underneath where one of the diesel alternators will sit. You can just see there the framework which would, the alternator would rest on. There was deck work happening as well um, during the dry docking. And you can see here this would where the master would normally stand when berthing. And the timber there um, was seen to be rotten and there was some work to replace. And there was this replacing deck will be an ongoing issue year after year. That's actually a view in the lower bar. It did not escape. There was some steel on the side of the dining saloon that came down into the lower bar. And you can see there where there's been fresh steel put in. Unfortunately, when you cut steel, you do create a lot of mess. Um, and you can see that there in that picture. So by the time we were in mid-March, the programme had changed direction in terms of how it was unfolding. The refit was taking a different path. We had much more extensive work in terms of the dining saloon, the galley, the lower bar, and also we had started work in the toilets. Um, so an interesting view of the toilets if you were to be using them without any partitions, but um, the toilets had also been uh, stripped out. So by this point, this project was now becoming exceptionally challenging. But of course, coming over the horizon was COVID because this was the time by mid-March when it was clear there was going to be an impact due to the, the pandemic. But work did continue. You can see there the boiler room looking much, much better. And one of the new diesel alternators in situ on the starboard side, one of the new caterpillars. And just to the left of that, you can see another sort of framework bed where the third alternator was placed. So the steel work did move um, pretty rapidly when they were in dry dock. Twenty fifth of March. Now, by this time, the UK was in lockdown. 
fails, we're going to decrease their staffing. Their apprentices were going off and furlough. And by this time, the Waverley office had closed and we had staff on furlough as well. And our own engineers were about to go in furlough. And a few days after this, there was only myself and the chief officer left um, out of Waverley Excursion really at the yard at that point. Um, and it really felt as if the project was coming to a, a sort of slow. The contractors were coming off at this point. All electrical work had stopped. The deck repairs had stopped. Other contractors were concerned and it was clear we were now going to really have a period where there could be much less progress. Um, so as she left dry dock, I, I felt quite concerned that we had achieved a lot up to that point, but the ship was exposed in terms of having the funnels off and she was about to be refloated as people were just walking off the site in the terms of contractors leaving because of the lockdown. But the boilers were still delivered and the few remaining staff at Dales handled that. It was the, more of their senior staff that were still there because there was still other ships that had to be repaired. There was an emergency repair came in, um, a chemical tanker went into the dry dock after Waverley. And of course, Dales helped maintain um, the essential lifeline services in terms of CalMac. So Dales as a yard remained open. So that's the first boiler arriving on the 31st of March. And considering that it had been almost a year since we really knew there was major issues with the boilers, this seemed like a real occasion to celebrate. But yet, because of the lockdown and how the country was, we didn't shout about this one, despite the fact it was such a key point in the project to see finally new boilers being delivered. And then the second boiler squeezing in, and there is very little room there to be able to get the second boiler in. You can see the essential guiding by foot as the boiler slightly moves underneath the bulkhead. And then two boilers in position. Not much space, a very tight fit. And you can just see there again to the left of that picture, you're actually looking into the engine room alleyway because the bulkhead, the steel is missing. Work did continue, but at a much, much slower pace. So by the end of April, when some pipe work and modifications had uh, taken place, the bulkhead was starting to go back up again. You can see there that the exhaust from the port boiler um, was sitting in situ, but um, we found that the steel in that was not suitable for long-term use. And then that was actually replaced, but it's just sitting there at that point um, before the deck was then rebuilt round. And by the end of May, we still didn't have all the contractors back. You know, we're still in the lockdown period. Um, and it was originally planned that it would be by that time that Waverley would have been back in service. Um, but clearly things were slipping. But you can see there, just in the bottom of the photograph, the two new exhaust uptakes by that time they'd been replaced. And this photograph was taken um, just after electrical contractors started returning. And it was one of them that took this picture. Um, they weren't local, they were staying um, in Greenock. And one of them had decided to bring a drone um, in the evening. He came down quite a few times and took some pictures of Waverley. And this is just before the, the funnels um, were due to go back on. You can see there that the deck where the funnels will sit, the fiddly deck, um, has been completed. Still final painting to be done on it, but it has been completed. And the funnels are just lying on the key side as well as the, the vents just up to the top right of the picture. A bit like a Waverley Meccano set in the yard with various parts of her lying around waiting to be reinstalled. And then the 17th of June was when she would get first of her funnels back. I had hoped that it would be the 16th because it would be her birthday, but we missed it by a day. Um, the aft funnel was the, the first to go back on. And just you can see inside the aft funnel there, you've got the exhaust uptakes from the diesel alternators. Unfortunately, all that pipe work was in good condition and didn't have to be replaced. A great picture just to show the extent um, of work and the image of one funnel moving to the ship. 
And then that's the, the forward funnel, just looking through the exhaust there. And you can see another funnel, the funnel of Hebridean Princess, which shared the dock with Waverley um, for most of the time that Waverley was there. So the Hebridean Princess had been out, had started her season, but had then returned to the, the James Watt dock the same day that Waverley had come out of dry dock. And she has remained in there um, since. The, the top of the funnel was then repainted um, as soon as it was off. It made sense to do that. And the whistle back in position, having been cleaned. I can see there the exhaust uptake from the boilers inside the forward funnel. And again, that pipe work was found to be in very good condition. And the forward funnel about to be placed in its rightful place, giving the impression that Waverley has two funnels sitting on top of each other. Now, this photograph um, tells me quite a lot. The, the project manager, Ralph Addison, that, uh, that supervised the full refit, um, Ralph knew, because I think I'd mentioned it so many times, <laughs> these funnels have got to be right. So there was markers on the deck. You can just see there that there is a steel marker um, and the funnel has been moved up to touch that point. So it is in exactly the right position. And then distance was measured between the funnels as well to make sure that they were in the exact position. And uh, Ralph knew just how important it was to get these funnels absolutely correct. So I was nominated to check that they were indeed in the right place um, and to approve that that was them, they could now be properly welded. Um, so I went up in a cherry picker to measure the distance between the rear of the forward funnel and the forward part of the aft funnel. And that is me up with one of the Dales workers with the measuring tape, you can just see it there, going between the two funnels. And measuring the distance. which was exactly 4830 millimetres. And you can see there that the measurement, the funnels were indeed exactly as they should be. And you can just see there that the inside of the top of the funnel has been painted by that time. Just looking ahead there again, you can see the Hebridean princess and one of the small Calmac ferries just ahead of Waverley. And another drone picture supplied by one of the electrical contractors with the funnels back on. And just to show you that the galley did indeed go back together. Here it is after being cleaned um, early in July. Now this was actually the job of a few of the office staff. They had been on furlough until the end of June. We returned them at the beginning of July. And one of the first jobs was to help clean the ship because we did have some crew arriving um, to help complete the refit and um, thinking ahead to sea trials. But at this time, we did not know we were definitely going to put Waverley back into service, but the board to take the decision that we would run sea trials to test the equipment and um, to prove that the new equipment was working as intended. But that required crew and uh, the galley, crew cabins, etc., had to be cleaned up. But by no means the rest of the ship was in a, a great condition. We, we focused on the crew areas. Just showing you the forward bar. There was almost no area of the ship that uh, wasn't disturbed during this refit. There's the injury room alleyway, and you can just see there that um, some of the decking is missing because the grey there is just the cut where the bulkhead was cut out in order to get the boilers, old boilers out, new boilers in and then that decking had to go back to be replaced. And the dining saloon, um, by this time, the new bulkheads were up. You can see they're around the windows, um, but it was very clear that the deck and the dining saloon, the mammalian flooring would have to be replaced. But from the outside, the world may have thought she was coming back together. Um, she looked okay from the outside, but internally there was still a lot of work going on. 
and still great uncertainty whether or not we could actually put Waverley into service given the fact that COVID restrictions um, were still in place and have remained in place. By mid-July, the toilets were being rebuilt. In some ways, it was the toilets that seemed to cause a lot of uh, the, the hassle. Um, it wasn't the biggest part of the job, but it seemed to be the bit that did cause a lot of complications in terms of different people um, working to do different parts of the work. The crew, though, took no time uh, wasting in terms of preparing the ship, um, cleaning her up. You know, she hadn't had a crew on her properly since 2018, and therefore things like the deck um, really did need a lot of cleaning. So the dining saloon deck, the old deck before it was lifted, but you can see there by this time the bulkheads were in position and also the heating, central heating that just runs along the very bottom there of the bulkheads was replaced as well. And the new boiler room by this time was coming together. That's looking from forward looking aft in the boiler room. And when you think everything you're looking at there has been out and put back. 22nd of July, and by this time we had to do an inclining test um, to reproduce our stability book for the ship. Because of the big structural change, change in weight, then we had to end up doing an inclining test. Now, when the crew arrived, which was the first week in July, or the few crew that were there at the beginning, it was a bit of a gamble because we did not know that the MCA, the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, could attend the vessel to undertake inspections and survey visits. The MCA had stopped visits because of the lockdown and because of the COVID restrictions, and many other vessels in the UK were having certificates extended if it was just an annual renewal, but Waverley had lost her spin out of service. We couldn't just have certificates extended, we had to have the MCA visits. When the crew arrived, I did not know when the MCA would be able to attend. It was a bit of a gamble. And the first day that we really needed the MCA to be there was the 22nd of July, and that was them just back at work in terms of visiting ships. There's one of the two ton weights that was positioned. You can just see the chalk mark on the deck. So these were moved from side to side just to tilt the ship and make measurements in terms of how much she moves, depending on weight distribution. Inside, the work continued in terms of refurbishing the dining saloon with the new flooring going down. The dining saloon is the only part of Wavelet's original timber decking, um, but it is actually covered with plywood before the flooring goes on top. Now, 24th July, um, that is the first sign of fuel burning inside the new boilers. Now, this seemed an exciting point because finally, Waverley was going to produce steam. And I think for myself, it was go upstairs and just check that the funnel does actually smoke. Now, of course, just the initial combustion, you got the soot, um, and then thereafter it burned clean. But uh, seeing smoke come out of that funnel seemed like another big step in the process to returning Waverley. And the new dining saloon deck. And other areas of the ship were starting to be cleaned up. The chief officer had arrived just a few days before this picture um, had taken, and with the chief officer being on board, then you were seeing every single visit, something else had moved on. There was big change. Waverley was starting to look as you should do for passengers. I mean, you have a photograph there of their girl flyer on the, the quayside, um, undergoing refit, and Waverley's bow had been cleaned up. Although I can see there to the left, the seating is still not in position around the forward deck shelter. And on the 31st of July, her paddles finally turned. The first time they had done so since October 2018. And within seconds of the paddles turning, it was online and someone from across the other side of the dock had posted video footage of the paddles turning. Always expected as soon as the wheels started turning that it would be found, it would be online, and it was. 5th of August there, and you can see the steam rising out of the forward funnel. This was the accumulation test. The test where the boilers are bottled up in a sense, they're then fired full with no steam escaping from the boilers, 
to test the safety valves. And the safety valves are set to lift at a certain pressure. And that has to be witnessed by the MCA um, to show that they are working as they should be. And they did. She performed exactly as she should have, lifting the safety valves with quite a sound effect as they lift. And finally, on the 7th of August, she escaped the James Watt dock. Now, what I quite liked, if you look at the photograph in the housing opposite, is that the local residents that had almost come to know Waverley to be there, she'd been there for so long, came out in the morning and stood there, some in their pyjamas, um, and watched as Waverley was towed out of James Watt dock. It is quite a narrow entrance. However, at this point, um, there was a a uh, late gremlin, if you like, in terms of the steering system, which had not had any refit work, hadn't been due, um, was uh, not performing as it should, um, and that did create some delay. Now, still at this point, we did not know if we were put her into service because we did not have the certification. There were still problems to overcome. The aft deck shelter, the, the T-bar, um, the lino in there, was really being replaced. There had been a lot of water underneath it and uh, we replaced that but to access that we had to take the seating out. So the seating in the aft deck shelter was then replaced or the framework for the seating. Um, another area of the ship which had to have work. As Waverley left James Watt Dock and left Dales, I was on the quay side with the project manager and I, I turned to him and said, you know, come in here in January. <laughs> And he said, I thought you'd never leave. And we both said, it wasn't a refit. This was a mini rebuild. And it really did feel like that. But this time she was at the Custom House Quay in Greenock, but there was still work ongoing. And then on the 13th of August, without any drama, she just paddled off. And I can remember standing on deck and it almost just seemed, is this real? She is paddling and she is sailing. No flags up, no one really to wave her off. And she just started paddling. And of course, again, within minutes, this was online. That's a photograph which I particularly like. Just, it was almost just captured on the moment because I was on the, the, the port paddle box, but the sound, the paddles were beating. It sounded like Waverley. She was back on the Clyde um, and it was just a moment just to listen to her and she was alive again. And then seven months after she left for what we'd hoped would have been a four month refit, she returned to Glasgow. And that's her just arriving back at the Science Centre. Now another piece of work which was done, um, the berth at the Science Centre has damaged the ship for several winters where the fenders on the key side have actually caught on the side of the paddle box and caused damage to the ship. So we did invest and replace the fenders. Now that was work that was supported by Glasgow City Council, um, but the, the original spec um, had been done several years bef before and therefore costs had increased. Um, and in order to push that work through, then we did contribute um, some funds to refurbish the berth so that the fenders that the ship then rests and she rests against them for over six months of the year were replaced. Now, just to move on and just give you a feel of the certification. This is not a process that can be done very quickly. And with Waverley being out of service, then some certificates had lapsed, some exemptions the ship holds in order to operate had lapsed as well. So there was a lot of certification to go through. But um, the one certificate that Waverley Excursions has to have in order to operate a ship, we need a document of compliance. Now, it was due for renewal um, just after the boiler refit had really been launched. And it was almost like a pause for the boiler refit to deal with the fact that we need a document of compliance. And that had been renewed in 2019, but it's got an annual audit and that had been carried out in July 2020. So the ship had a safety management certificate reissued. Passenger ship safety certificate was issued. UK Passenger Certificate, UK Air Pollution Prevention Certificate, UK Oil Pollution Prevention Certificate, Domestic Ship Security Certification, 
certificates that we do hold insurance for wreck removal and personal injury. And then several exemption certificates um, that were all reissued. So the process for this was quite involved and we really owe a lot to the MCA that did work with us very well in terms of trying to get Waverley certificated to sail. Now, we had hoped that it would sail actually on the 21st of August and we did slip a day, just the sheer amount of paperwork and putting the certification in place. Part of those certification though is crew drills. A major part of that is to see how the crew perform in an emergency. And this is not a firefighter from Greenock, but this is actually one of the crew members. This is the second officer um, dressed up in the full firefighting equipment. Now, if I just slightly roll back, um, the 2020 season um, had been planned well in advance. And by early March, before COVID or really the full impact of COVID was known, then the timetable for 2020 had actually been fully drafted. Um, and just a sample here, the Scottish sailings, you can see the, some of the dates. Um, and this had all been planned. The main Clyde summer timetable had been planned. The South Coast, the Thames timetables had all been planned and drafted. They hadn't been formally um, published in any way, but the drafts were all there. Contact had been established with each of the peers in order of the fact that they knew we'd go at a certain time and a certain date. Um, so a lot of this was in hand um, and it takes a long time to build the timetable when you're operating right around the UK, all the ports and piers that ships can go to. By um, early March, some crew had been appointed and then had to be stood down. Um, marketing, marketing materials have been developed, contract signed for digital marketing, um, but all of this in vain in a sense because she didn't obviously sail when we thought, um, but there was no certainty at all. We kept the decision open, the board took the, the point that we would keep the decision open for as long as possible and we did, um, but it was getting very close to call. The fact that the season would then become so short, it just wasn't um, worth starting. But I do believe that it was absolutely the right decision to sail the ship, to show everybody that supported her that she was back, that she had overcome the boiler issues from 2019, and that somehow or other colour had returned to the Clyde again, um, particularly the day that she was operating. But it was the 18th of August when the board took the decision um, to sail, and tickets went on sale that evening and we had a record number of tickets sold in five days and after that most sailings were sold out with the limited capacity. We had to put COVID-19 procedures in place for crew in terms of temperature checking and um, just procedures on board for crew. Passenger procedures had to be developed. Um, local authorities were contacted our Gallant Butte Council North Ayrshire in particular because these are the areas that operate a lot in the Clyde um, and I know there had been concern raised within the local authorities the sort of perception that Waverley back would create busy towns places she was going and they needed sort of reassurance um, and I had to provide the risk assessments and all the procedures the company was developing um, to reassure local authorities same with port and peer owners Again, just some reassurance on how we were going to be operating. It wasn't going to be like Waverley would normally be. It wouldn't be 600 passengers coming into Rothsey, for example. Um, and there was a lot of liaison all the time while the refit was still happening. And there was ifs and buts whether she would actually go into service. Covid restrictions, though, meant less than 30% passenger capacity. Um, to control numbers so tightly, then we went for the advanced booking only, because this was going to be a short period of sailing and just to control numbers um, fully, so there was no ticket agents. It was all handled by Waverley Excursions, the vast majority through the website, which was great because that helped manage it in the office because we didn't go up to our full complement of office staff either. Um, One-way systems on board, like we've got used to, um, limited catering. So there was no hot meals, proper hot meal service we've done in the past. The timetable was much reduced, fewer peer calls, slower boarding, um, all part of the COVID. Now, this gave us a, a chance to see how these things work because if there's still COVID restrictions in 2021, then we have got the experience of operating the ship um, in order to hone um, exactly what the procedures are. We issued a leaflet to passengers with tickets that were been booked so that they were aware of the restrictions. 
and uh, this was shared on board, shared with the local authorities so that everyone was aware exactly how we were going to be operating. So 22nd of August was the first passenger sailing, first sailing since the 7th of October 2018, when she finished her sailing season on the Thames. I think it was probably the best um, day in terms of weather. That's her at Bocaranza on that same day. And the North Arran Coast Cruise was a new addition, if you like, to the sailing schedule, which proved popular. It was a very attractive cruise. And then based on the fact that uh, we were managing to work with the COVID restrictions and that sailings had sold out, we had so much demand for limited supply, that we took the decision to extend the season until September 12th. Now this was aided on by the fact that we had a charter um, booked for the 7th of September, the day after we'd intended to stop, and then we put sailings on for a further five days. We had released information that we'd extended the season, and one of the sailings that was then added sold out within 24 hours um, but we really had to be quite confident that the sailings would sell out because at the restricted numbers we were only covering fuel and crew costs there was no extra been put in the pot at all so if we hadn't operated at capacity each day then she was actually losing funds by operating then on the 3rd of September when returning to Brodick Waverley's bow landed on the concrete ramp um, and this incident has became very well known. It was obviously picked up in the media and by press um, and it was seen as a, quite a major incident in terms of handling. Um, you can see there the bow damage now that she's back in Glasgow. Um, there was a temporary repair done to the bow and that was overseen by the MCA for her to sail back under her own power um, to Glasgow. The full repair will be made when she visits Dry Dock. And it's just worth mentioning with the Brodick accident that the MEIB investigation, Marine Accident Investigation Branch, um, they will publish a full report. That will become public, but up to the point where that is published, we can't make any comment on the causes and then what's been put in place. But Waverley Excursions has undertaken its own internal investigation. Now, that ultimately will remain confidential, but it's not going to be different that much from what the MEIB um, investigation has. And we have had a lot of contact with MEIB. They've been very cooperative um, and we've tried to be that way with them as well, very open, um, because after all, we don't want something like this to happen again, we want to reduce any risk of anything like that happening again, and we're putting actions in place. And there's many actions that are identified, it's almost an opportunity to review the way the ship is operated and the procedures, and many of these are now in hand and progress. But the repair costs to the ship and the pier um, will be met by insurance. So the current winter refit, Quite a lot happening. There's several five-year survey items that would be every um, winter as you've got the rolling programme. And then there'll be annual things, for example, fire detection system, firefighting equipment, life-saving apparatus, and then the hull survey and bow repair. Now, just to give an idea of the type of costs, uh, this is where you really realise just how much funding Waverley requires to maintain her. Um, and you can see there that the biggest, the biggest part of the winter is the dry docking, and that's our estimated costs. We're still to complete or finalise at this time the dry dock spec, but we're already much earlier um, in the winter period, just after she'd stopped sailing, um, scope the work um, and put our own estimates to it, because we had to know exactly what the funding requirement would be and what we're then going out and asking people to help us with. The new central heating system that's been installed in the, the boiler room, and this is really only used in the winter period, so that the fabric of the ship is not damaged and left and the ship is not getting too cold. There has been um, problems in the past with burst pipes, um, with the ship's temperature dropping um, and this past week that has proven to be very successful with temperatures of minus seven, minus eight recorded at her birth. Engine work has been the focus and you can see here part of the engine, the MP, the medium pressure part of the engine there, um, stripped for survey. 
And you might hear the term survey and think, what does it really mean? Um, in my non-technical layman's terms, it's take it to bits, we'll look at it, check it, compare with previous measurements made years before. How has it changed? Is it suitable for further use? Yes, put it back together. No, replace it, put it back together. Um, and the survey work is, is ongoing. Just looking onto the, the MP again there, the crosshead. You can see there's some blue dye. That's just to check the surface contact between the slippers that actually go up and down the guides um, and how that makes surface contact to the, the guide itself. And again, measurements are made, checked back with previous records to see if anything's changed since it was last um, inspected. I just a photograph of the rear of the engine where the covers are off, um, just get into the cylinders. An unusual view, looking at the crankshaft. Um, this picture was taken during the inclining test, but just to show you in terms of the Sponson steelwork, the paddle box steelwork, and all the steelwork around the paddle box um, has to be uh, check for thickness, check how thick it is, compare it to um, what it sh should be or would have been new um, to find if there are any spots, any parts of the steel which need replacing. Um, this was one where when someone comes along, it was only done um, just over a week ago, that you almost hold breath just to see exactly how much work, how extensive. And um, we had identified a couple of areas that we thought where the steel was looking to be needing replacing. And fortunately, it has just been the areas that we anticipated and there hasn't been surprises. She hasn't thrown us a surprise on this one, which is very fortunate. And that's just two photographs just underneath the paddle boxes, just showing you the steel structure underneath and all that steel has been checked. That has actually been able to do that at her birth in Glasgow. So the COVID-19 relief appeal. First of all, just why another appeal? You know, we'd had the boiler refit appeal, but COVID in terms of its impact on Waverley denied us the opportunity to sail the ship for a season. And had it been a normal year, after being out of service, we could have hoped for a really strong season that would have put sufficient funds to be able to go through the winter. In a, in a good year, if we go back to, for example, to me, 2016, there was an excess of 700,000 in the kitty beyond what the ship would cost to operate, but that's what's needed to survive through a winter in total. Because beyond the winter refit, there's the shore establishment, office cost, insurance, berthing. Um, and even in 2016, donations still helped the company to survive even with that excess. So we've had lost the chance to earn sufficient funds for that excess to be able to last through the winter. Um, it was in the case of when she stopped sailing, she didn't have enough funds, even for several months. It was, you know, it was a very short period. We needed the, a relief appeal to come forward. We set the individual donations target at 350,000, but the amount of money needed is beyond that. But that's what we felt we'd try and ask for individuals to contribute. And the appeal total up to today is 255,731. So there is still some way to go before we've got the target we set for individuals, but we are pursuing other um, funding sources and haven't met the target set for them yet either. Um, other funding sources, gift aid on donations, um, any donations it is welcome if you can gift aid, um, but as well as other grant awarding bodies and trust funds and uh, regular donors through the Friends of Waverley giving um, scheme. We have gone back to the trusts which helped with the boiler refit in the sense they're warm to us because they know us um, and hoping for some funds to come that way but at the moment there is insufficient funds to take the ship to dry dock. The Code Relief Appeal now, the donor wall is uh, very extensive with 1200 names on it. Um, so thank you to everybody that's donated to the COVID relief appeal. Um, many people have opted to have their names. Many don't. Many prefer to remain anonymous, but um, it just shows the level of support when you can see the donor wall and uh, the names there. But as I said, further donations will be needed um, before Waverley moves to dry dock. April and May is when the greatest expense occurs on the ship the dry docking and then the commissioning costs, bringing crew on, crew been on for maybe two weeks before 
um, you know, the, the daily cost of crew is expensive when you then look at maybe 14 days of that with no income. Um, and without knowing that we can afford to pay for dry dock, we just can't move the ship to dry dock. We will need to have more funding in place before she can move to dry dock. So looking forward, the beyond part of the talk in a sense. Um, first of all, it's surviving the impact of COVID-19. Um, as we're all aware, it's, it's not gone away. Um, we're still living with restrictions in terms of lockdown restrictions and not be able to go out about as we would like. Um, and we need to try, Waverley to try and come through that. The impact has been severe on us in terms of COVID. You know, we are a, a visitor attraction um, and without people being able to sail on her, pay for her, then we are lacking the funds. The 2021 season um, is probably deserves a big kind of question mark at the end in terms of when that can begin and what that will look like. Um, at the moment, we don't have the, the roadmap, as the government might talk about, in terms of coming out of COVID um, lockdown. Um, but we'll be guided by the government guidelines again in terms of when tourism can reopen and then what the restrictions might be. Um, I would like to be ambitious with Waverley and allow her to do everything that is possible. Um, and I tend to start with that wide ambition and then have to start coming back. Um, it depends on the restrictions. So as soon as we know what we can do, then we will tell people because after all, there's tickets to be sold. Um, but at this time, uh, we don't know exactly what the 2021 season is going to look like. I have already got concerns over refunding for the next winter refit because unless you can operate a full season without restrictions on capacity, then there isn't really that much opportunity of putting all the funds in place for the winter refit. Now, if she can operate for a reasonable length of season and possibly carry a little bit more passengers than last year, then we can put, start to put some funding in the in the pot for the next winter but i i do think there'll still be a funding requirement and we are going to have to rely on further funding sources beyond sailing revenue to go through the 21-22 winter refit period i do feel there's a reputation rebuilding um the ship has not sailed um for example down south it'll be three um season three years since she's been back um in scotland okay she did operate short brief spell in 2020 but we need to get over the fact that she's you know out of service and um, there's COVID to overcome um, and then there's Brodick um, if you look at Waverley in the news the most recent item you're going to find is Brodick and I think until she actually has operated and gone back to Brodick and been seen then we've got over that part. Um, I think also looking forward sort of sustainable future for the ship I mean the one thing to realise is that technically she is new in terms of the boilers and electrical systems. So she's had huge investment. Now that's two million pounds of investment. I don't want to give up on her now when she's just had that investment. So she is good technically for many years to come, um, but it takes funding and ongoing maintenance. But you don't invest that much in the ship with so much support um, to then lose her now. Now, Waverley can't happen without people, both crew and shore staff. And investing in staff in terms of trying to bring people in permanent jobs that then feel that it's worthwhile contributing for a period of time. Because of the ship being out of service, then there were redundancies on permanent crew. And we need to re-establish permanent crew again because it's permanent staff that invest in the ship and can give the best because it's it's their livelihood, you know, it's, it's what they need to be successful, for them to be successful. And I really do feel investment in staff is, is a concern we need to invest. The timetable and fare structure, um, I, I think fares, you know, we do need to try and maximise the fare revenue. Um, and the timetable needs to be the attraction to be all buying a ticket. Um, there are people suggest, make timetable suggestions. Um, and if someone actually had a timetable suggestion, I'd be very happy for it to be received to the company. Um, I would always look at anything if someone's able to identify, for example, uh, a peer that Waverley could use. And that's been done before, where someone has identified a peer that was being refurbished, think Waverley could operate. We then look at that and see if it is possible, because we need peers. The ship has to visit peers to get passengers. Um, so we want to look to expand the peers, if possible, if there are any. Um, but retaining the current ones, um, there has been some peers lost in recent years. The likes of Helensborough, more locally on the Clyde, 
Um, and every peer we lose is potential passengers. Passenger experience, onboard services, catering, um, et cetera, and the sort of comfort on board, um, that has got to be a focus. We've got to try and make it the best we can. Um, she isn't a modern vessel, so you don't have the same level of comfort, uh, but we do need to consider that, you know, the passion has to have a good experience to want to come back, to say to other people, to advise them to go, that this is worthwhile supporting. And then we need to make fundraising a more regular part of what we do and um, to support the investment in the ship. She is always going to need work, refurbishment, maintenance, repairs. Um, the rebuild in 2000 and 2003 almost sort of said, oh, she's, she's new, we're 20 years on from that. Um, some of that rebuild is life expired, like the boilers. Um, and we do need to try and plan for that uh, and invest in the ship. Um, and then just to sort of finish off, more or less, um, just some statistics. Some people might be interested to see. I'll go back and use the 2018 season here. Um, the most recent season that she operated for the, the full season, although it was a year where weather disrupted the South Coast and Thames apart, and that had an impact on revenue. But it just allows you to see there where the costs um, accumulate, where they're allocated. Now, just for a, a sort of a comparison here, if I take an average adult ticket price of £40, just to see where that £40 really proportions up, where it goes to, and you can see there how it compares. And you might notice that if you total it up, it is not 40 pounds. In actual fact, based on 2018, if we were selling a ticket at 40 pounds, it actually cost 60. So where did the funding difference come from? Fortunate that the catering and souvenir sales provide a profit. And also fortunate that donations, bequests, and PSPS support excuse me, support from the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society made up the shortfall. Now, of course, sell more tickets, we have more revenue, that relies on the time to win attractive, marketed properly to attract passengers. Um, but in, in for, for some time now, we've always required the, the donations um, to support the, the ship's operation. But it just gives you a feel there for the, the, the funding um, requirement. But this is what it's all about. Waverly sailing, people enjoying a day out on the Clyde, as it is here, coming into Tarbot. And I look at that scene um, and I can picture myself being on board and there's a bit of an atmosphere, um, a good day out, an enjoyable trip, nice scenery on a historic ship that you know is unique, a ship that's really quite light and people are fond of, but you're part of it. And every single passenger that steps aboard Waverly helps keep Waverly sailing. In the Western Isles, a favourite for many, sailing in the Western Isles. The Bristol Channel, build a tradition of paddle steamers. That's leaving Elfracombe. On the south coast, going round the Isle of Wight, tell a favourite picture of myself. It was the cover image for the, the calendar, 2021 calendar. Or in the heart of London and the Pool of London, as you sails under Tower Bridge. So how can you help Waverley to survive? Um, more immediately, support the COVID-19 relief appeal if you can. Um, just looking back at the boiler refit appeal, and the number of people that gave, and a sense if everyone that gave to that could give another twenty pounds, we would we would have reached the, the the target for individuals quite easily. Um, so if you can support the COVID nineteen relief appeal to see us to dry dock, it's two months to Waverley needs to move to dry dock, and at this time we cannot to guarantee we've got that cash. We can't move her at this moment. And commit to that spend. Sail on her though. Sail on her when she is operating, encourage others to do so. The fare box is the greatest source of income for the ship. You may wish to join the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society. It is the PSPS, or it was the PSPS that saved the ship. And in total, the PSPS is given over £3.8 million to support Waverley. You can join that for just £25 annual membership fee by visiting the Society website. And you'll get a magazine every three months that would have Waverly News in it. 
So if you can join the society, that's one way to support. Um, sign up to Friends of Waverley, the direct get a debit giving scheme. That is just 5.20 per month minimum, so just over a pound a week. Um, and if we can establish real core support through Friends of Waverley, then it's budgeted income, which we know we have. Um, 5.20, because it's engine number 5.20, you can help keep the engine turning. There are other amounts as well, um, but that's the minimum sign up for Friends of Waverley. And simple, just buy items on board and the, when they're on, also in the online shop. Uh, because uh, that all helps to add um, surplus, as you saw from the, the fair statistic, then the shop sales do help to contribute to the funding which Waverley requires. Um, and I just want to finish by acknowledging that the only way Waverley sailed in 2020 was because of the support for the Boiler Refit Appeal, because of the office staff and their commitment um, to Waverley, and because of the ship's crew um, and the, the crew really did go above and beyond to prepare Waverley for service and uh, her officers in particular deserve full credit for the fact that she came back from that refit and she was very well presented um, to the public. Now, um, I'm very happy to accept any questions. Um, there is an email address there, um, questions at waverleyexcursions.co.uk. And if anyone was wanting to send a question, then I will try and answer it. Um, we've probably got about 20 minutes or so, we'll be able to take some questions. If anyone would like to um, email them in. And uh, someone's quick off the, the, the mark. Um, and it's uh, in terms of Brodick and there's a cause of Brodick being identified. Um, as I said, that the MEIB investigation will um, be published, that will be public, and it's only at that point can we share um, information um, on the Brodick um, incident. Um, yep, yeah, and here's another question. Um, will the new boilers prove fuel efficient compared to the old? There has not been much difference. We, we sort of budget on 700 litres um, per hour, but we haven't really operated enough to really see. Um, and we'd hope um, before Scrinty service, again, that we'll, we'll do more proving trials just to ascertain um, exactly the fuel efficient. The new boilers will only be burning marine gas oil, um, which is low sulphur, and that's because of regulations that came in in 2020. Um, that fuel is a little bit more costly. Um, so while we might have slight, there could be a slight increase in efficiency, but the cost of um, fuel. So that is one question that's just come in there. And I think I've got four. Um, this is a question about the shop. Um, the Linton tea towel is unavailable. That has just arrived. Um, so the, the tea towels that were out of stock, um, there's some orders arrived this week. Uh, so we will end up um, putting that back on the website um, shortly. Um, here's a question um, in terms of Waverley heading south. Um, Waverley's been going south for quite a time. She's obviously been going south since 1977. Does she need to go south? Could she operate in Scotland only? The, the South Coast Thames, the Bristol Channel has made, uh, has, has given the ship a lot of revenue um, and that revenue has been vital. Um, the season in the Clyde only traditionally was quite short and Waverley has been going south um, at the times where there would not be the same demand on the Clyde. Um, but the one thing I'd put in terms of the, the boiler refit is that there was actually more donations in terms of monetary value came from the Thames area than from the Clyde um, and the support from down south in terms of the south coast and Thames towards the boiler refit appeal was, um, was, was fantastic um, and that shows me the support for Waverley South. Um, I don't see late September into October producing the numbers that you will get on the Thames or the south coast. Uh, so that. Okay, the questions are really starting to come in now. Uh, I'll just try. 
um, there's a question and it's uh, out of curiosity, which area of the country provides the best revenue? Now, it's hard to qualify best revenue because the costs vary depending on the area. The Thames can provide the largest revenue per day. And in fact, I think 2017, 18, thereabouts, I think there was one day where the ship gross revenue was around 60,000. Um, but your costs for operating on the Thames are so much higher. You've got pilotage costs and also quite often the Thames sailings rely on coach connections and therefore you've got um, that to afford as well. And in a sense that each area has, has different revenue figures. Um, I think really from what's seen in the past, she needs all areas. It's that all round support. Uh, and that's what we saw through the boiler and um, refit. So it's not just as straightforward as best revenue. The Clyde is very solid business, July and August. The South Coast traditionally has been strong in September and uh, the Thames late September into October. Um, right, uh, I've got another question here. And it says there are smaller craft which provide cruising experiences. Um, is this something likely? Um, some mini sailing holidays. I don't know quite maybe what you're suggesting be smaller numbers, um, but Waverley's capacity and normal class four and five certificate is up to 860. Um, she has big capacity uh, and it's those big, it's the big footfall that provides the big revenue. So if you reduce the passenger numbers, and you need to put the fares um, up. But the board has certainly considered um, and has been a point of discussion if we could do different type of days where the numbers are very restricted, but the fares would be much higher and might include catering and things. So there has been some thought um, around of changing the business model. Um, I have been in the job as general manager for two years, but have only sailed the ship for 12 days. <laughs> My record is quite poor. <laughs> um, so I think we do need to get the ship back to our operation that we know um, and then I might be in a better position to make judgments and uh, sort of change but the business model will have to continue to develop and, and change to ensure survival. Um, so that answers uh, that question. Somebody has asked uh, did you learn anything positive from operating during Covid? E.g. the timetable was quite different to normal and might have worked better. Um, yeah well generally that the timetable was um, very different. It's whether that timetable could be sustained over two, two and a half months on the Clyde. Um, the, the timetable that had been fully drafted for 2020 looked a bit different from what it had been in 2018, um, particular looking at midweek sailings to try and increase footfall. Um, over the last sort of few years she operated, a Tuesday, for example, on the Clyde has been low footfall. Um, so therefore looking at ways of trying to get that up. Um, but we'll, we'll try and look at the timetable to be attractive. It's not just for enthusiasts, it's the general public as well. We need to attract as many as possible. Um, so yeah, there has, been, there has been some of that learned um, from the timetable. We'd always look back at past passenger numbers and revenue when making judgments on the timetabling so that you know what you might expect from a particular day and what a timetable can deliver as well as considering what the cost is to operate that timetable. So I hope that answers um, that question. Um, somebody's asking, are you able to confirm any potential plans for Waverley to come down to Ilfracum or to the London area in, I think that's a typo, but 2021? Um, as I've said, we, I would really want Waverley to do all she can do and visit all the areas. It's just at this time, don't know how COVID restrictions will be eased um, and if they're eased sufficiently to allow us to carry a little bit more passengers than we did in 2020 um, because it's passenger numbers and revenue that will really be the decider. Um, we were operating on uh, low passenger numbers, very low passenger numbers, and it was only covering fuel and crew costs. If we're going to go south, I need to be confident that we can cover those costs and even put a little part away for the following winter refit. So um, there's there's not an answer at this stage. Uh, just keep following our website. If you've signed up to the e-newsletter, then uh, you will get updates. Uh, another question, um, what is the likelihood of some Scottish government funding? <laughs> um, we have uh, at least uh, been in contact with the Scottish government, but there is a great demand on government funds. 
Um, so that one um, is, is not a, a no or anything at this stage, but uh, we have at least we've had some dialogue with the, the Scottish Government, as we have with all those who supported the boiler refit in terms of trusts as well. We are trying to source the funding required um, from many sources. It can't just be individuals giving, we are looking beyond that. Um, question here, how many crew are on Waverley? Do they sleep on board? She has about 25, 26 crew normal. Her minimum crewing for full pasture service is 19, but because of the catering, um, we tend to carry a bit more than that. Um, every one of them sleeps on board. There are 27 beds on board the ship. Most of them are underneath the forward bar area. Um, if you're looking at the ship, you'll see under the bar, forward bar area, there's portholes, and that's the portholes to the crew cabins. Um, Waverley's um, weakness, in a sense, with crew is the fact our accommodation or crew accommodation is not what you would get on a modern vessel. Um, and that is something which we can't really change because the ship is the size she is. Um, but the crew do live aboard, and mostly with our crew, they are on for the full season. They may have a couple of weeks off at times, but they do come for the season. Most of the crew are seasonal. Um, as I said, we do need to re-establish some permanent crew because then they're there for the full season, and they're also there to assist through the winter and the planning and maintenance. Um, but yeah, the crew do sleep on board. I did start on Waverley as a crew member um, 25 years ago. The crew accommodation has improved slightly um, in that time. Um, I'll just, there's another couple of questions here. In fact, there's quite a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to go through the questions and just, and, and just pick um, as, as I go. Uh, someone here asking, uh, thank you for an excellent presentation that has been um, interesting. I hope people have found it interesting. You've mentioned, uh, have you mentioned two scenarios, sale in 2021 or abandon 2021 and avoid winter dry docking and go straight to winter 22 dry docking? Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that's someone putting forward a suggestion. Um, at this time, we are intending to aim for sailing in 2021. Um, but uh, I have to say that I would still have, again, that thought has gone through my mind. Um, it's something that will remain. But at this time, we're focused on putting Waverley into service to operate her so that she can cover her daily operating costs. And then hopefully we can also earn a little bit above that to start to secure the next winter refit. Um, it's not as easy as just going stop and then don't sail because you've got the office, you've got ongoing insurance, there still has to be maintenance on the ship. Um, she's missed a lot and to miss another year completely, um, I would be concerned about that because I think after so many years of being absent, she then becomes missed. Um, I don't want her to be missed, um, I want her to be operating. Waverley is maintained better when she's operated and when she goes into a full sailing season. Okay, and I'll just pick another uh, couple of questions. Um, somebody's asking, with open sailings as early as late May, would they probably be left off the schedule? Um, I think that question would be just suggesting that if she normally goes to open late May, early June, possibly this year, I think that's what the suggestion is there. Maybe she won't do that. Um, at this time, I'm just I'm open to considering that she operates in all areas. It is almost constantly under review. And as the government outline the, the, the guidelines that will come forward from the government in terms of tourism reopening, that's what I'll be using to consider. Um, at this time, I'm open to her operating um, a full season. Um, and we'll just keep it under constant review. Um, I'll pick another. Um, somebody's asking, with um, will the Brodick incident lead to an increase in the insurance premiums? Um, so far, no, um, but our insurances, there's several insurances, um, and we actually are in the renewal period at the moment. Um, I have not seen any alarming increase um, in insurance premiums at this time. Um, somebody says there, um, the £20 shortfall in profitability per ticket seems alarming. Effectively, the more tickets sold, the higher the shortfall that needs to be covered by donations. Though the more tickets that were sold, that would add to 
um, the revenue and therefore the shortfall in each ticket would come down. I just used the £40 as an average example from one season. And if I did that on different seasons, you'd get a different shortfall um, if the ship was sailed every day with maximum passenger numbers then you would be earning sufficient funds but there's reasons why she's not going to be full every single day um, and away you are trying to sell all the tickets um, but that's not being achieved every single day. There are days where you will sell out, there will be some sailings that are sold out um, so the more we sell um, for tickets then the more revenue the more likely we are to cover costs um, but I do think that we will have to increase um, tickets. We have to, you know, we can't just hold ticket fares um, at what they were. Um, there had been an increase um, into 2020, but it's still got to be an attractive fare for people to want to come. Um, someone's asking, uh, now that we have left the EU, will we still be able to employ crew from EU countries? Um, that one is not easily answered. I don't have an answer to that. Um, with um, our crewing agent that we use, there's still um, some question marks around that. It is probably more likely that, um, that there will be less um, coming from EU. Someone, very easy question. What is the working boiler pressure? Um, 12 bar, Waverley's engine, 12.2, um, possibly 12.4. It's 180 PSI the engine is designed to work at. Someone says, will the absence of the MAIB report before sailing commences be detrimental to passengers sailing or joining from Brodick? We intend to sail Waverley from Brodick and I think it will be likely the MAIB report will be published before Waverley enters service. Um, I think that is a, an ambition that that report will be um, published before. Um, I, I, you know, Brodick, we have to go back. It's, it's a very popular destination on Isle of Arran um, and um, Waverley has to return. Um, somebody said, fantastic insight to the sailing of Scotland's treasure paddle steamer. Thank you. Um, I could go on for many hours um, on uh, Waverley. So I do hope it's just that sort of short, quick insight into what's been very challenging time. So I'm glad people enjoyed it. Um, I've already donated to the COVID appeal, but we'll be doubling my efforts. Thank you. Um, I really do appreciate. We can't do this without people's support. Waverley doesn't, you know, in all case, she's owned by Waverley Steam Navigation Company. She doesn't, but, you know, she's not ours. She's the people's, the people's paddle steamer, as um, the Scottish Government referred to last year. And it's everyone that uh, sails on her, donates to her, that wants to see her sail past and give something that helps Waverley to continue. Um, question here, um, someone referring to Balmoral, which used to operate with Waverley. Um, Balmoral is preventing from sailing to Isle of Man by the MCA. Will Waverley be sailing to Isle of Man? We don't have any certification at the moment to sail to the Isle of Man. Waverley has been there before, um, but it is classed as an international voyage. And at this time, um, it's not something which we can do with the ship. Um, maybe in the future it could be, but at this time, um, no. Um, what new marketing initiatives are in progress to bring new pastures and build on the heritage of Waverley? Um, the, we had planned um, to start using much more digital marketing in 2020. Uh, we had set up a contract with a digital marketing provider nationally, a um, six-month contract, um, and they were very keen to um, see how they could push Waverley drive um, sales. We know that newspapers um, sales have been declining and of course there are several newspapers actually stopped publishing for a period, particularly the local papers during the COVID crisis. Um, we did not promote or use any paid advertising in 2020. Um, but I do think the Boiler Refit Appeal taught us a lot about marketing differently. The e-newsletters and the response we get from e-newsletters is really, really strong. Um, and that's gone from being about 30,000 to recently over 77,000 email addresses. Um, if we can build that, then that's a different way of marketing. And that is very low cost, but it is done by Waverley Excursions. But I am keen to drive much more through social media and digital marketing. Um, but we'd still retain some of the traditional marketing because of who we're trying to attract in terms of customer base. Um, but again, <laughs> 
I've not personally been managing Waverly to be able to see and I almost sort of try and test different market initiatives, but I do feel that online marketing and digital marketing must be there. Um, I've still got a lot of questions here, so it's great to see this response. Uh, someone saying, are you planning to bring out new lines in clothing area season year t-shirt? Yes. Um, we are clothing stocks at the moment are very low, but it is an expensive item for us to buy in. Um, I really need to know the ship is operating to bring in new clothing. But anytime we produce new clothing range, we'd want to change it because it encourages people who may have bought in the past to buy. Um, we will keep changing the souvenirs, but there will be core souvenirs that are always there. But we will always keep trying and changing because we see a response. We see people buying. Um, and as I've said, souvenir sales help to support Waverley's operation. Did you manage to get money back when you had the boiler sent for scrap? <laughs> uh, I'm afraid not at the cost of transportation um, and that there was nothing, there was no gain um, from the boilers. I, I mean, people did say, could you cut them up and sell parts? But the cost of doing that and the time and the labour, I wanted those boilers out, away, give me the new ones, get the new boilers in the ship. Um, you know. Um, somebody asking, is it planned for Waverley to call it Loch Ranza in 2021? Yes, I would like to see Waverley at Loch Ranza. Um, I really want to see her um, back. I want to see Waverley doing all that she can do because that's what's needed to ensure that she survives. Uh, someone else there about um, Brexit and uh, Europe, Eastern European cruise. Um, I've kind of said about that one. Um, the response here to questions has been fantastic. How much is the bow repair likely to cost? Um, I wouldn't know fully until it's uh, done. We do have a, a quote at the moment from um, Dales, but it's not information I can share just at this time. Uh, but uh, as I said, the, the cost of that is not being funded by the COVID-19 relief appeal. The repair to the bow is not part of the, the funds we require. Um, somebody's asked about the Western Isles again, um, so again I've said uh, I'd like to but I don't know at this time. There is obviously a lot of uncertainty. I have found in this job and living with uncertainty is just normal, um, but more so through Covid times. Um, I would like to be able to plan and have things in place earlier, but we are still very unknown. Um, somebody asked here, um, what challenges do you envisage for Waverley in finding suitably qualified deck and particular engineering staff in the years ahead? That will be a challenge. It's one which we are very aware of. And even discussions this week, we are looking at appointing um, engineering crew who are keen, who want to be with Waverley for some time. Um, and as it stands at the moment, it's the one department that I do have crew for the coming season. Um, and I really feel that we need to invest in people. So if, if someone is wanting to commit to Waverley and we pay for, for example, certain courses for them to go through so that they have qualifications and then they stay with us for a period of time, that starts to invest in the future. I want them to have permanent engineering in particular and deck officers because they commit to the ship and they give the best for the ship, which then comes back to us um, in terms of our operation. Um, the ageing profile, someone's mentioned it as well about engineers, and yes, we do need to try and attract, and that is a definite challenge. Um, we have had, uh, for example, second engineers of the past that have maybe been a bit younger, and again, if it's somebody can come through the ranks, then they learn the, the job as they go, and if that maybe means we end up affording their college courses to go from second engineer to chief engineer, I feel we've got to invest in people to do that. Um, Waverley been out of service for so long, then, you know, how is someone going to come from a permanent job in another company, which is very secure, to Waverley, having not operated as much? Um, you can see why people wouldn't move easily. We do need to try and make it attractive, and that might be through, for example, paying for college courses and things. So I hope that um, answers that question. Uh, again, I'm just having a look. Someone else has mentioned Isle of Man. I think I've fit that. Um, in done to persuade port operators to maintain access 
uh, dredging at Girvan, Adrosan or Troon. Um, dredging in Girvan, just to pick that one, that Girvan has been dredged uh, and will be. It's a port that's maintained. Um, um, Adrosan, I'm not aware of any limitations on tide at Adrosan, but of course it is a ferry terminal and Waverley has used it on rare occasions. Uh, um, just moving through. Ah, someone's picked up this. Um, I noticed in your presentation that there was breakdown for the mess. That's the crew mess, which is in part of the paddle box. And because that's the part of the paddle box where the steel needs replacing, we have to then dismantle that area of the ship to get access to the steel. And we're not just going to put the same back in. So there will be a bit of refurbishment in the crew mess area. Um, it's on the port side of the ship just opposite the engine room, it's the crew mess area. Um, that does need refurbishment, it's not had any refurbishment in 20 years, but there are some steel um, repairs needed. Um, if I just do another couple of questions, i um, really got to obviously draw it to a close. Um, I'm just trying to pick here. Um, are you maybe the first person ever to present at consecutive PSPS meetings? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. Um, will we be able to sail to? Uh, will Waverley ever be able to sail to Inverary again? Um, she might be able to go up Log Fine. It's calling at it Inverary. We'd need the pier um, to have work done to it to make it suitable. She has been to Inverary. We we do need piers to be maintained. We can't pay for peers. The only berth that we have paid some for is Waverley's winter berth. Um, we do need to encourage um, peer owners um, to support, or to allow Waverley to call. The more we use the peers, the more it'll encourage. Um, and there has been successes where peers have been reopened because of Waverley and Balmoral. Um, in one sense, having a second ship like Waverley, for example, Balmoral operating in the UK, that supports Waverley because it uses peers um, and therefore um, peers are maintained. Um, some people just sending in comments rather than, than questions. And uh, I'm just going to pick another couple of questions, funnel mugs, just random questions that people are coming through with. Just a suggestion, the mugs are great, um, can be just the same rake as the real thing. <laughs> a novel souvenir suggestion, mugs that are raked. I don't know how the drink sits in them, um, but uh, thank you. Um, people asking a lot of questions around where she'll visit and where she'll, she'll go um, and what she'll do, but there are a lot of unknowns. Um, if you've signed up for the e-newsletters, then you will get information, follow our social media. Um, we will put out information as soon as we know for sure. Um, please do um, keep in touch that way and you'll know. Could Waverley call at other ports between Scotland and the Bristol Channel when making her voyage? Um, I suppose I us talk about the voyage south. Um, we do try to do that in a sense where she has visited Liverpool en route. Um, there is a lack of peers in certain areas um, and there's uh, restrictions on what, exactly what she can operate in terms of partial certificate and the type of areas that she can operate in. But it makes sense for her to try sometimes and operate en route to somewhere else. She kind of does that if you think of the Thames via Liverpool, Bristol Channel, South Coast and then the Thames when she moves. Um, I may try and go through some of these questions and actually respond back by emailing. Um, if I just take um, one more question and then I'll um, stop. Um, somebody here uh, just given a comment actually, so I'll just take another um, question. Somebody says, um, as older pastors myself, so we've been traveling alone, went to Glasgow at night, it's quite daunting, especially on logs. Um, can the timetable be better in line with train timetables? Um, th there are restrictions on that. I think someone's just asking about how we connect with trains. The, the run up the river takes an hour and a half at least, um, so that does have an effect, but uh, it's trying to fit in around ferries. A lot of the timetabling on the Clyde is built around ferry connections to try, if possible, and avoid a clash with ferries at piers. Um, I have had it in mind to check train timetables. I can think of an example, of, um, one of the open sailings, I particularly moved it half an hour earlier to fit the train connection. Um, 
I will try and consider that where possible, but there are limitations um, on that. Um, I'm going to stop with the questions there. Um, I think it's worthwhile mentioning though that there is just one other paddle steamer in the UK that was operating, in fact two, there was Kingsweir Castle, the river paddle steamer that operated very successfully in 2020, and also paddle steamer Monarch. Um, so Whaley's not the one, but she is the last seagoing, she is the last one that will be able to go around the coast of the UK. Um, I just want to finish though, there's, there's clearly a lot of engagement here, which is great, but thank people for their donations and their support, because without that, Waverley won't survive. She will not continue in operation. She needs you to maintain um, her and continue to operate her. Um, so I will stop at this point and stop sharing my screen and pass back to Murray Patterson. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Paul. That was absolutely superb. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed that. A really, really uh, thorough and comprehensive uh, over, overview of the entire uh, refit process in terms of the boiler. And subsequently, uh, I must admit, I've done quite a few dry docks in my time. They all have a life of their own. You start off with a carefully uh, considered script and all the things you want to do, and very soon events take over, and you will be faced with all kinds of problems that you didn't expect. And I think you've had the full gambit of all of that this time. And with the, the COVID problems uh, added on, which really must have been quite a nightmare. But it does say a lot for yourself and for your team, the, the way that this has been handled and handled so successfully. And I think also, certainly from our point of view this evening, the fact it's been so well documented, it's been extremely interesting and extremely uh, informative in terms of uh, just how these things work and go on. So I think you, uh, apart from your presentation tonight, for which we commend you and uh, offer you uh, our sincere thanks, I think also your um, handling of the dry dock situation. Uh, I think you've got the right personality for that, dealing with all these things. Uh, you seem unfazed by many things and uh, a good working relationship with not only your own team, but with the MCA. Um, and of course, the MCA are people uh, that, that at the end of the day have the ultimate say in everything. So to have a good relationship with them is, is absolutely essential. And it's been really a, a treat to see uh, so well presented and beautiful photographs you've taken. I hope there's a book in there somewhere sometime, but uh, uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to hear it all. And I, on behalf of everyone, I would just like to thank you most sincerely for an excellent evening and indeed for the work that you have detailed and all that you and your team, and I hope you'll take our thanks back to your team yep. as well, in the office as well as the ship staff. And we we'll look forward to getting you a bit more sea time in the coming year uh, than we unfortunately uh, managed last year. But again, thanks also for giving us a chance to see the ship in operation uh, after all that hard work. So I would just say to everyone, uh, we maybe can't do it for real at the moment, but a collective round of applause for Paul this evening and uh, his team and for everything that has been done and for showing us so brilliantly uh, just exactly a glimpse and it can only be a glimpse yeah. into the hard work <laughs> that has been going on. So thank you Paul and before I, I um, sign off um, can I just also say to everyone please do consider again the funding options. At the end of the day this is our ship we need it to work we want it to work and so much has now been expended uh, to, to get it back into the condition that to be derailed a little bit by COVID is very unfortunate. And I think that um, it would, we would want to see the ship back. And I think after all the hard work the company and Paul and his team need uh, and deserve uh, to see the fruits of their labours coming forward. So if you can, please, I would echo his appeal for uh, more funding. Um, also. Uh, I would just like to thank on the committee, uh, Gordon Wilson, um, Graham Franco and Alan Smith, who actually know how all this technology works and for whom we, should, we owe a vote of thanks uh, for the success of this evening. So thanks to them also. Now, uh, I have just a couple of bits of news, which we normally have. I spoke to John Beveridge today regarding yet another part of steamer, and uh, he sent me, if I can find it, just some brief notes to keep you up to date with the Maid of the Law. Um, 
And I'll read this because he sent it and it, some of it's uh, in, done rather briefly. Ship slipway and office have closed and no work is taking place on site due to COVID restrictions. Staff working from home, but planning to reopen at Easter unless told otherwise. Uh, we successfully applied, they went to the lock, successfully applied for a grant from the Wolfson Foundation and managed to get £35,000, which will help them through the winter. And designs and, pl and plans have been approved for the replacement carriage for the slipway, but they're still awaiting confirmation of a grant from Historic Environment Scotland. So that was the main parts of the news from Maid of a Lock, but it's perhaps right we also um, spare them a thought and remember that they're having their own troubles in this situ situation, but they're still going. And uh, if you can support them uh, in any way, that would be good also. So uh, I think the OAS has one other item, and that's just to say that um, thank you to everyone who has um, watched this this evening, who's tuned in. And just to let you know that the next public online meeting will be on Saturday, the 6th of March at 1400 hours or 2 p.m. when the Wessex and Dart branch of the PSPS will host a talk entitled Punching the Tide, and this will be given by Peter Lamb. Uh, this talk will detail the perils and pleasures of operating a passenger vessel from an exposed seaside pier in the 21st century. Uh, and a link to enable joining this meeting will be emailed in advance. So that again is the, just to repeat, 6th of March at two in the afternoon, and it's a Saturday and it with Peter Lamb, and I'm sure that'll be well worth watching too. So once again, I thank you all for taking part, for Paul for his uh, excellence of his presentation, and uh, for everyone who's taken the time and trouble to join us this evening. Uh, I say, keep safe and good evening. Thank you. <laughs>